This podcast is for general informational educational purposes only and is not to be considered medical advice for any particular patient. Clinicians must rely on their own informed clinical judgments when making recommendations for their patients. another episode of PHM from Pittsburgh. I am still your host, Dr. Tony Tarcici. We are here at UPMC Children's Hospital Pittsburgh in the Paul C. Gaffney Division of Pediatric Hospital Medicine coming to you for another episode. This is our now annual flu vaccine and flu season update. Uh, We've been doing this every year to kind of make sure everyone's on board and knows what this flu season's been doing. This year has been getting a lot of press. So if you don't know, I, you must be on vacation, and, and good for you if you are, because we've been super busy here. The hospitals have been over full, and we've been getting just patient after patient with flu B. So I, at this point, I want to bring on our regular guest, friend of the podcast, and second most common guest uh, to be on the podcast, Dr. John Williams. For those of you who are new, Dr. John Williams is a professor in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine the Chief of the Division of Pediatric Infectious Diseases here at UPMC Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, and the Director of the Institute for Infection, Inflammation, and Immunity for Children, or i for kids uh, John, thank you for joining us again. Afternoon, Tony. Always a pleasure to be here. So let's do our disclosure stages before we start anything else. Uh, I'll go first. I have nothing to disclose. Uh, I serve on the Scientific Advisory Board of Quidel, Scientific Advisory Board of ID Connect, and on an independent data monitoring committee for GlaxoSmithKline, none of which have any relation to what we're talking about today. So uh, the flu season, we're hearing a lot about flu B. It's all over the news, um, and I feel like we're seeing a lot. But what I, uh, and, and well, why don't we just get right into it? Am I right? Yeah, there really is a ton of flu B this year and early. We see some flu B almost every year. Typically, we see flu A early in the season, and then flu B comes late in the season. So what's really been unusual this year, and you are exactly right, your experience is correct, there's been a ton of flu B, and it's been early. In fact, only really the last week or two, we started seeing more flu A. So the last time we had a season with this much flu B this early was in the early 1990s. Is that right? Yeah, over 20 years ago. Now, I read that flu B, this this strain, tends to strike children and young adults more, and that typically it'll cause less severe disease than flu A. Yeah, there's some truth in that. So severity, flu B often is not as severe as H3. Of the two type A flus, H3 and H1, H3N2 is usually the most severe. But that said, I mean, flu B absolutely causes severe disease and kill kids. I mean, right, you and I are seeing these patients in the hospital. If you take 100 kids and infect half with H3N2 and half the flu B, okay, the ones with H3N2 will probably be sicker. But a bunch of those flu B infected kids are still going to be in the hospital and have severe disease. So, yes, it can be a little milder, but it's capable of causing severe disease. Part of the reason flu B may be worse in younger kids and older adults. Uh, Part of it is just younger kids and older adults tend to do worse with flu anyways because they both have sort of either immature or weakened immune systems in the older adults. The other thing that can make a difference is our immune system sort of remembers influenzas, you know, of Christmas past, as it were. And so if a certain person has been exposed to a certain type of flu a lot in their life, you know, that's not enough memory immunity to keep them from getting sick. So they still need a flu shot. But something is better than nothing. So that little bit of memory they have from having seen it before may be enough to lessen severity. So, you know, otherwise healthy young adults, if they've had flu B in the past, yeah, they still need a flu shot. But that little bit of memory probably protects them some. Now, that's a great segue. When I was preparing for this, I was reading an article uh, by Gostick et al., G-O-S-T-I-C, sorry if I mispronounced that, titled Childhood Immune Imprinting to Influenza A Shapes Birth Year-Specific Risk During 
seasonal H1N1 and H3N2 epidemics. This is in PLOS pathogen in uh, December of 2019, so recent and a good reputable journal. And one of the things they went over that I really did not know is this concept of immune imprinting. Now, they stated that, in a, a, that it's a lifelong bias in immune memory of and protection against strains encountered specifically in childhood of flu. The way I understood it is you'll get a stronger immune protection against uh, strains of flu that you're exposed to in childhood even later in life. And they talked about in some of the big flu pandemics, there's always a birth cohort that seems to be spared. And they think that's because of this imprinting. Um, am I understanding it right? That actually was a beautiful explanation, Tony. Yeah, this for this phenomenon um, of imprinting, you know, as the twig is bent, so grows the tree. This was first recognized in the 1960s uh, by Rob Webster and Graham Labor and others uh, who coined the, just a beautiful term for this called original antigenic sin. Mm -hmm. And what that meant was, and they did this, they showed it in animal models and with humans in vaccine studies that basically if you vaccinate a human or an animal with, you know, let's say H3N2, okay, and they make an antibody response to it, great. Then you come back later and you vaccinate again with a vaccine that's a little bit different, okay, a different H3N2. They do make a response to that new variation, but they have a much bigger response to the one they saw before, even though you didn't boost them with it. So, you know, yes, you make a new response, but your original response is more potently boosted. So that was the idea of original antigenic sin. And in recent years, the paper you mentioned and Scott Hensley at the University of Pennsylvania and others have been looking at this. Uh, and in fact, one of our colleagues here at the University of Pittsburgh, Seema Lakdawala, studies this area. It turns out that if you're exposed to a particular type of flu early in life, either through infection or probably vaccine, that does sort of flavor your responses. So uh, those of us who remember the 2009 influenza pandemic, mm -hmm. usually what I just said is true, that older adults usually get a lot sicker with flu and they have the highest death rates, right. but not in the pandemic. And the reason is those people over 65 had been seeing H1N1 that was very, very much like the pandemic since early in their life. So those of us who weren't that old, because you and I are comfortably under that age, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we'd never seen that particular H1N1 before. So it was new to us. So yes, we made a response to vaccine, uh, but not as much as people who had seen that early in life. And you know, imprinting is also a very good term for it. So, you know, we don't really know yet how we could use this. Could you, people are working on a universal influenza vaccine. Boy, if you could like vaccinate a child with all the different strains that you think they will encounter in the future, you know, that would be great. Um, but, but I do think it's important for people to remember, as we try and understand this phenomenon of the immune system, this imprinting, even for a strain, you know, even if you or I, you and I are imprinted on viruses we saw in our youth, we still do respond to a flu shot. So yes, we might, might respond more to the original antigenic sin. That doesn't mean we don't respond and still get a benefit from a flu shot. So I think it's important for people to remember flu shots still are very effective at reducing severity of disease and saving lives. Well, the first area I thought about for this was, uh, as a pediatrician, we, we talk to parents all the time in the hospital about getting flu shots. And most of the, almost all the kids I've seen did not get the flu shot who were coming in with flu. And is this, so if, if there's a child, I'll take my kids, for instance, from six months of age, have been getting the flu shot every single year. So does that mean they're imprinted against all of those strains that they've seen? So if later in life they go the other way and don't get any more flu shots, do they have some protection because I made them get vaccinated at such a young age so many times? 
Yes and no. And I'm the same way, Tony. I, my kids have all been vaccinated every year since the age of six months. I think even though, you know, let's say in 20 years, the strains really change. And instead of H1, H3, which our kids have been getting vaccinated with for years, it's, you know, H2, which has circulated in humans before, and H5. Okay. So now our kids, 10 years from now, you know, they're encountering H2 and H5 flu. Well, you know, when they get an H2 and an H5 vaccine, that's going to primarily boost their H3, H1 because they're imprinted on that. Mm -hmm. And that's not going to help them. Right. But they are still going to respond to H2, H5. So on one hand, I think people raise the question, are we biasing our kids' immune responses? And the answer is probably yes, we probably are. But it doesn't mean they're not going to respond to those future vaccines. It, it also probably doesn't mean that our kids, any more than we, will have very long-term protection. This is another problem with the flu vaccine. It's just the immunity that it induces doesn't last all that long. All right, tetanus, you need a booster every 10 years, or pertussis. Flu, there's very little leftover protection from last year. And I should say in the article, they did talk about those who were immune. I want to say they used they used the term, which I forget, which meant people who hadn't seen flu very much, they were affected harshly by every single pandemic. So, you know, the more the more you see, ideally by vaccination, but of course, if you get the infection, uh, the better for your immune system for as you go along. Oh, I think that's absolutely true. And the other thing that isn't well studied in humans because it's difficult so we make two kinds of immune responses to flu. We make antibodies mainly to the outer proteins of hemagglutinin, HA, and neuraminidase, NA. And that's in every flu name, like H1N1, H3N2. That's the H and the N, the HA and NA proteins. And those are the ones that tend to drift and mutate and change year to year. And those are the ones that typically change in a pandemic. But the other genes and proteins of the influenza virus, the internal proteins, we call them, um, we make T-cell responses to those. And actually, it turns out those change a lot less. Now, those T-cells, that memory T-cell response, it's not enough to prevent infection, but it does help clear virus faster. And you can prove this in animal models that it reduces the severity of infection. It's hard to prove that in humans, but yeah, there's no question that being exposed to flu uh, vaccine over and over, we build up T-cell immunity that does hang around and does contribute somewhat. So I just got over on the AAP Smart Brief this morning, and we talked about this a little bit before the show, um, that there is the highest number of pediatric flu deaths so far this year uh, for this time of year that we've seen. Yeah, because the season started so early, and a lot of states here here in Pennsylvania, uh, there was a notice from the Department of Health uh, last week that basically we've had as many cases and deaths already as we did last year for the whole season. So flu started early, it has hit pretty hard, um, and you know, despite what we said about B overall being a little milder, it still can cause severe and fatal disease. So I think. Unfortunately, I think we're still going to see a lot of flu illness and, unfortunately, some deaths in the rest of the season. Now, can we talk about the number of cases we're seeing and is there a dip? So I have a chart I looked at from the CDC, but what do you think? Yeah, we, you know, it's interesting because the CDC is national data. One thing I'd encourage your listeners, you know, flu is so regional. Mm -hmm. uh, now, overall in the country, we can predict everywhere we're going to have a flu you know, epidemic. That's going to happen every winter. But when and how hard it hits in your area is just really hard to predict. Florida and Texas were getting hit hard two months ago. Yeah. So I would encourage your listeners, you know, your local hospital, they can get probably on the email list to report from the hospital lab. So I'm on this list uh, and I get a report every morning from the hospital lab for the whole system Here's the results of all the tests we did yesterday, all the flu tests. So you're, you're right. Locally, flu B, which we talked about, has hit hard and early, has started at least the last week or so slowing down. 
and we're seeing more H1N1 flu creeping in. But for reasons we don't understand this year, we've had almost no H3N2. So locally, I think we're seeing a little bit of a dip, but your listeners in different areas, uh, they, they might be just starting to take off in their region. Now, can we, if we started so early, can we reasonably expect the flu season to end early? Unfortunately, no. Oh. One of the, uh, I, you'd like to think so, right? There's uh, one of the senior experts in the field of influenza, Arnold Monto, uh, who's an adult uh, epidemiologist person at, uh, well, of course, we're all adults. I mean, he's not a pediatrician. Uh, he's an epidemiologist, adult ID person at the University of Michigan. Arnold says, well, when you see one flu season, you've seen one flu season. I, so you just can't predict. I've seen years in my career where it's starting to take off early. Winter break comes. The kids get out of school. They stop spreading, and it just dies. I do think that's why we've had this little dip, this little sort of deflection is, you know, having the kids out of school is kind of breaks the transmission chain a little bit. But, yeah, we could have another month or another three months. And again, very regional in, in, in each place. Now, one of the questions I always ask you about the flu is how good is our vaccine this year? But one of the things that the CDC has started to do is change tactics in how they discuss the vaccine. Kind of what you and I have discussed in years past, they are bringing up the fact that you may still get the flu with the flu vaccine, but you may not get, you shouldn't get, it should protect you against the encephalitis, the meningitis, the necrotitis, these things that will kill you. Is that right? Has the CDC been really putting that out there more? Yeah, I think there's really growing evidence. A lot of us have believed that for a long time, but without a lot of hard evidence. But there have been, you know, several recent studies. In, in fact, one that we were part of here at the Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh uh, in the new vaccine surveillance and flu vaccine efficacy networks um, that looked at, you know, how good is the vaccine at children at protecting against disease severity. We know that overall, all I mean, if, if you want to have like a ballpark number in mind, you could say overall in all comers, flu vaccine is about in an average year, about 50% effective at preventing flu at all. It's more effective in kids and that's against preventing flu. But your point, when you look at reducing severity, like likelihood of death, likelihood of ICU, likelihood of pneumonia, I mean, those things are reduced by, you know, two to threefold, you know, reduced significantly in kids who are vaccinated. So I think as pediatricians, we can really say, because I have parents say to me, well, the flu vaccine doesn't really work. Well, it's not as good as the tennis vaccine, but something is better than nothing. And, you know, uh, home from school sick is better than going to the ED. Being in the ED is better than being admitted. And being admitted to the ward is better than going to the ICU. So reduction of severity, that's a big win. And that's what I tell my patients. But that being said, how good is our vaccine this year? Yeah, so this year, um, the, the, the CDC every year is, and just a reminder for your listeners, you know, the flu vaccine every year is a highly educated guess yeah. by U.S. and world experts, CDC, WHO, pediatricians are involved, it's based on strains that circulate in South America the year before, or the Southern Hemisphere the year before. Um, but, but it's still a guess uh, that they make in February or March, you know, of the mm. year before. Yeah, so it's way in advance. Okay. So um, the H1N, and then what the CDC does is throughout the flu season, they collect isolates from all over the country and they test those to see how well they match the vaccine. So what we know now is... Uh, of the flu B strains, there are two flavors of B, and almost all the B is of one flavor, and about two thirds of those are a very good match for the vaccine. Okay. So that means two thirds are a very good match, good protection. The other third, some protection. Again, something better than nothing. Mm -hmm. For the H1N1, all of those they've tested have been an excellent match. So we're not seeing a lot of flu A yet. We're starting to see H1N1. That all looks like it'll be very protective. H3N2, which I mentioned is often a problem, is not a great match, but we're not seeing that much of that. This can be regional, too. I think 
for your listeners, in real time, you can find this data uh, on the CDC website. In fact, there's a website called FluView, F-L-U-V-I-E-W. Okay. Updates every Friday, and it's a very nice summary of these kinds of things. The, the, the effectiveness of the vaccine can be regional, too. Unfortunately, we never find this out until after the fact. But in 2013-14, it was a big H3N2 year. And m- even amongst the H3N2, they're all a little different, it turns out. So the H3N2s that were in most of the country were not a good match, and the vaccine effectiveness was terrible. But for whatever reason, here in Pittsburgh, our H3 into that year was a very good match. And we had much better vaccine effectiveness than the rest of the country. Well, well good for us. I know. That's nice, <laughs> nice to hear. So what you're saying makes sense with what I see. Because when I get the kids that are admitted that I take care of uh, who have flu B or have flu and who are sick enough to be in the hospital, almost none unless the child is very medically complicated with significant comorbid other issues, got the flu vaccine. I rarely see a child who got the vaccine short of a rare asthma exacerbation here or there, um, and that's not a lot, get admitted to the hospital. Yeah, no, that's absolutely true. And then when you look at the fatalities, several hundred children die every year in this country from flu. A little more than half of those were totally healthy previously. So they're not the high-risk, complicated kids. Why is that? Because we, as pediatricians and parents, we're pretty good at getting flu vaccine to the high-risk kids. Mm -hmm. It's the otherwise healthy kids that people think, oh, well, you know, Joey doesn't need it. It's just the flu. Uh, So of those otherwise healthy children that die of influenza, about 80% are unvaccinated. And I think this is what's a little scary and a plug for the vaccine. About a third of those kids die before they get to the hospital. So I think sometimes people think, well, you know, if Abdel gets the flu, then I'll come in and get him treated. You may not have time. Yeah. I mean, I've seen these patients where they just collapse in a day or two very rapidly. So I just think we as pediatricians have to be very clear on the science, N- not our personal belief, although this is my personal belief as a pediatrician and parent, but, you know, the science and the evidence, uh, A, flu vaccine saves lives and reduces severity of disease. B, flu vaccine does not make you sick, will not give you the flu. And C, flu vaccine doesn't cause autism or anything else. So we should be really encouraging all of our parents uh, to get flu vaccine. When I, like you, when I take care of kids in the hospital, who had the flu and who were not vaccinated. I mean, of course I don't on day one make the parents feel guilty and say this is your fault. But, you know, I feel like I owe it to them, and this is true of any vaccine preventable disease, along towards the end of hospitalization when they're getting ready to go home. I politely and kindly and respectfully say, you know, I feel like I just have to let you know that there's a vaccine for this and it very likely would have prevented this pneumonia, meningitis, whatever. And they can do with that what they will. But I feel like if I don't point that out to them in case they don't connect the dots, then I've done that child a disservice. And I've never had somebody get angry and upset. You know, you can do it in a polite, kind way. But we we owe them that honesty that, hey, this trip wasn't really necessary. could have been prevented. Think about it next year. Yeah. I do the same thing with all the kids I can and tell the parents that and you know, some have said, oh, we're doing, we're getting the flu vaccine next year. I'm not doing this again. After their third or fourth day in the hospital, it's an inconvenience. They miss work. They miss everything else. The kid is sick. They're very scared. And towards the end, they're a little bit more reasonable about it. Um, so it's not too late. And this was an early season. So I had a lot of parents tell me we get the vaccine every year. My doctor's office was out of it. And then, you know, Thanksgiving hit. And we were just busy. And we were going to get it. But they got busy. And then, boom, they got the flu. But even with those kids... Still a good idea to get the vaccine. We're starting to see H, H, uh, H3N1, H3N2, H1N1. Uh, flu A. Flu A. So, flu A. We're seeing a little H3N2. We're seeing more H1N1. But yeah, no, it's definitely not too late. Even if a kid had flu B, I, we actually see kids 
who get more than one type of flu in the season because, you know, like we talked about, usually you have A first, then B. This year we have B first, then A. There's no cross protection. Mm -hmm. So the kid you admitted last week with B, you know, he could easily come in in three weeks with A. So, yeah, people should definitely get the flu shot if they can. I, you know, I took my kids to the local grocery store. It was just more convenient to take them there in the evening. Well, that's everything I wanted to discuss. John, did we miss anything? Should we bring up anything else we forgot? Uh, I don't know if we wanted to briefly touch on treatment. Sure. Well, I think, I mean, the, the, the CDC guidelines and Infectious Disease Society of America guidelines have not changed. Basically, to summarize, all hospitalized patients infected with flu should be treated. High-risk outpatients uh, strongly recommended that you either empirically treat or test and treat. For non-high-risk outpatients, I I think it's a discussion to have between the care provider and the family. Uh, I mean, I have personally treated my, thankfully, otherwise healthy children when they got the flu, despite getting a vaccine, because I think there's reasonably good, not great, reasonably good evidence that treatment early can reduce severity of disease. But there's not great evidence. Right. And rarely do we see kids in the first 48 hours. So if they're not high risk and it's after 48 hours, forget it. Like there's no value. But if they're not high risk, but it's in the first day or two, I think it's worth discussing with the family. Hey, we have a medicine. Uh, your copay is going to be about 75 bucks uh, for most of you. And um, I think it's likely to reduce you know, the length of his illness and potentially severity. There's a chance he might vomit, less so if he takes it with food. If he gets really sick, we can just stop it and just see how the family feels about that, you know. But I think often we as providers say, well, he's not high risk, so I'm not going to treat. I, I think we're cutting the family out of the decision loop there. So I would encourage people to consider it uh, in those cases. Now, are the kids that come into the hospital day four or five of illness, dehydrated, throwing up still, uh, not able to tolerate PO, and that's why they're admitted. We, I always have a decision dilemma, and they're so far out. Tamiflu may not, or also Tamivir is probably not going to help that much. The guidelines say treat. What do you recommend? I, I think that's the thought process, Tony. If you have an otherwise healthy, let's say, four-year-old, mm-hmm. and uh, they've clearly been ill for four days, and actually fever's going away, but now their main problem is dehydration. Uh, you know, that child probably doesn't have a whole lot of virus left. And so in that case, I think it would be reasonable to say, you know, I'm really not sure if the treatment offers much benefit here. But let's say a six-month-old and the, the under six-month-old have the highest hospitalization rates in mm-hmm. children. So you get a five-month-old who comes in on day three or four, that child with their immune, their immature immune system they're probably still shedding a lot of virus. Mm. So there probably still is some benefit. And for the immunocompromised patient, we know there's very good evidence those patients can shed virus for a long time. And so uh, I, that, that's how I think of it, is um, if they're coming in later, I sort of think, okay, what are, the, what are the odds that this person still has a lot of virus? I mean, we don't have any way to test that clinically, you know. I can test stuff in my lab to see how much virus is there, but not in a practical clinical sense. Okay. John, that was great. Anything else? Get a flu shot. Get Wash flu your hands shot. and get a flu shot. And that's, that's, that's always, a good, always a good thing to say. <laughs> never, never go wrong with that. Thank you very much for being on. I really appreciate taking the time out. Tony, always a pleasure. Time for our acknowledgments. I want to thank our special guest again. I really do appreciate your time. I want to, as always, thank the UPMC Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh and specifically the Paul C. Gaffney Division of Pediatric Hospital Medicine for continuing to support the podcast. I want to take the time to remind our listeners that there is CME associated with most of our podcast episodes, courtesy of the University of Pittsburgh. So thank you, University of Pittsburgh. Please just click on the link at the bottom of the podcast. It takes you to a web page. Create a free username and password answer some questions that I write that are not hard, and that's it. You get AMA Category 1 CME credit. I want to, as always, thank and acknowledge Dr. Megan Keene-Tarchichi, who helps me with everything. 
But I really want to thank you all who are listening. Thank you for letting me uh, come into your earbuds or your car, wherever it is you are. I really appreciate the fact that you do that. Uh, if there's anything you want to hear or think we can cover better, any comments, suggestions, compliments, whatever you want to do, again, as always, please feel free to email me at Tony, T-O-N-Y, dot Tarchichi, T-A-R-C-H-I-C-H-I, at C-H-P dot E-D-U. Thank you again, everybody. I hope you have a great day. We'll see you next time.